This movie's topic is prokaryotic transcription regulation. And the goal here is to understand how bacteria and other prokaryotes turn on or turn off the genes that they do or don't need to be transcribed and then later translated into proteins. The sort of interesting way of thinking about this is not a lot of us think about bacteria as having senses, but they do need to be able to respond to their environment. And it doesn't make sense for bacteria to be turning on genes that they need to process certain nutrients, for example, if those nutrients aren't available to them. So for this reason, we're going to look at the LAC operon, which may be a topic you've heard about before. The LAC operon contains one transcription start site and three genes, LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A. So three genes, but they're all transcribed together in one single RNA molecule. And that's what defines this as an operon. This is a process of transcription that doesn't happen in eukaryotes, by the way. And upstream, somewhere else in the bacterial genome, there's a part of the chromosome that encodes a fourth LAC gene, LAC-I, which encodes a protein called LAC repressor. And these molecules, proteins that regulate transcription tend to have two different domains. They'll have an allosteric site, which is where a small molecule, like maybe one that's shaped like a triangle, can bind. And when that molecule, called an effector, binds the protein, that changes it to a different shape hence the term allo or other steric shape. So LAC-I, the gene, encodes a protein called LAC repressor. Okay. And what LAC repressor does is it binds to a site in the promoter that's upstream to the five prime direction of the transcription start site called LAC operator, which we denote as an O. And LAC repressor normally has a shape like that, let's say, that means that as soon as LAC repressor, the protein, is produced, it will bind to the operator. And the binding of LAC repressor to the operator prevents transcription from happening. It represses transcription. And one way you can think about this happening is that upstream here, in the five prime direction from the operator, there's a, if I draw a little bit more DNA here, but still that's very far away potentially from the LAC I gene, is the promoter. And this is where RNA polymerase, the protein, would bind. So I'll call that RNAP. That's the protein that transcribes the LAC operon. And if the repressor is sitting here, tightly bound to the operator, which is what it does. It's a protein that has a specific shape that recognizes a specific DNA sequence at the operator. So the operator is a specific DNA sequence that LAC repressor recognizes and then binds just to that part of the DNA. And what that does essentially is physically block RNA polymerase, the repressor does, from moving past the, the repressor and reaching the transcription start site where the RNA polymerase would start transcribing the operon. So the question is, what happens when an effector molecule binds a repressor like LAC repressor? Well, in this case, what would be really great for the bacterium is to turn on the LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A genes when lactose, a sugar, is present and can be used by the bacterium as an energy source. LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A are genes that help bacteria take up lactose from their medium and then metabolize it. So what happens when lactose is present is that it will bind to LAC repressor. And that binding of LAC repressor changes the shape of that protein 
so that it no longer has a specific shape or site that allows it to bind DNA. So an important point here is most proteins that regulate DNA transcription have two different domains. They'll have a DNA binding domain, which is where the protein interacts with, recognizes and locates and binds to a specific DNA sequence. And they will also have that allosteric site, a site that regulates the shape of the protein. And again, when that small molecule effector is bound, that will change the shape, allosteric, changes the shape of the molecule, the protein, so that it no longer binds, in this case, the operator, lacto. So in the presence of lactose, the repressor changes shape and falls off of the operator, leaves the DNA, then RNA polymerase can go ahead and transcribe the LAC operon, produce LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A proteins that are used to metabolize, to take up and metabolize the lactose molecules when they're present. This is a really inge ingenious, fantastic way for bacteria to sense their environment. When that small molecule lactose is present, it causes repressor to fall off of the LAC operon, the operator, and then RNA polymerase can transcribe the genes the bacterium needs to take up lactose. Now, as soon as lactose is depleted, if the bacteria has used up all of the lactose that are present, including that molecule right there, what happens? The lactose effector dissociates, falls off of the repressor protein. The repressor goes back to its shape that allows it to bind to the operator, and then it shuts off transcription of LAC-C, LAC-Y, and LAC-A. So that's an easy way to think about how the repressive system in bacteria works. And there's a general thought, it's an oversimplification, but it's a reasonable one, that the main mode of transcriptional regulation in bacteria is that genes are turned off by repressors until they're needed. The default state, a good assumption, in a bacterium is genes aren't being transcribed unless something represses the repressor. And this is a good time for me to talk really briefly about genetic nomenclature having to do with genetic interactions. So in this case, we've talked about lac repressor and the lac operon. LAC, Z, Y, and A. And there's a particular interaction between the LAC repressor and the LAC operon. LAC repressor represses the activity of those genes. And geneticists draw these repressive interactions using a blunt-headed arrow. On the other hand, if there was something that stimulates, for example, RNA polymerase is essential for the activation of LAC, Z, Y, and A, we would write that RNA polymerase activates, it's essential for, it causes activation of lac C, Y, and A. We use a regular arrow, a normal single-headed arrow to represent activation interactions. And then we've got repressive interactions with the blunt-headed arrow. Now, as we're geneticists, we're interested in how DNA sequence changes affects this system of LAC-I, which again produces that LAC repressor molecule, which has a particular shape, a DNA binding domain, and the allosteric site. Now this protein, LAC repressor, is produced by a gene, so mutations can affect LAC repressor. And remember that LAC repressor interacts with the LAC operator sequence, which is a particular DNA sequence here upstream of the LAC operon. So there are a few different types of mutations that can change how this system works and how LAC repressor turns off the production of LAC Z, LAC Y, and LAC A, and how lactose, the effector, small molecule that changes the shape of lac repressor so that it no longer represses, 
how those interactions occur. So the first mutation that we're going to look at is called the OC mutation. And that stands for a mutation at the operator that produces constitutive transcription. And what constitutive means is always on. So you can think about the regulation of transcription as having an accelerator and a brake, just like a car. And in constitutive transcription, it's like the gas pedal is pressed all the way to the floor all the time. There's no regulation of transcription. Transcription is always happening. And so we can look at this model and ask ourselves, well, how would a mutation to this particular DNA sequence, the operator, affect how repression works? Well, an essential component of this is that the repressor has a particular shape that recognizes a particular operator sequence. If you change the sequence of the operator with a mutation, an asterisk, say, what's going to happen to the ability of LAC repressor to bind to this operator? So let's change the shape of the operator a little bit. So a single nucleotide change, but it's going to change subtly, slightly, the shape of the DNA so that the repressor no longer recognizes the operator. So in the absence of the effector, lactose, where lac repressor would normally be up here trying to bind to the operator, there's a conflict in the shapes of the lac repressor protein and this new DNA sequence, the mutant operator. So the repressor can never bind to the operator. Hence, we have constitutive expression. When there's no repression of the lac operon, then transcription is always happening. The RNA polymerase is always able to bind the promoter, transcribe the lac operon. So that's the basis of the OC mutation. It's a mutation that changes the normal sequence of the operator so that the normal wild type lac repressor can no longer bind there. A second type of mutation that affects prokaryotic gene expression regulation in terms of the bacterial lac operon is called the LAC I minus mutation. So this is going to be a mutation to the gene that produces LAC repressor protein. And this also produces constitutive or always on transcription of the LAC operon. Here's how this process works. Think about what sorts of changes could be made mutations to the DNA sequence that encode this protein. So this protein is going to potentially have a different shape. What could cause a change in lac repressor that would make it never be able to repress, that is, transcription is always on? Well, you might consider that there's a mutation in the gene that creates a change in the protein sequence so that lac repressor has no DNA binding domain. That is, it doesn't have the right shape that recognizes the lac operator, the operator, not the operon, so that this protein, when it's cruising around the cell looking for places to bind, there's no interaction between it and the operator. It can no longer bind because a mutation has changed the shape of the protein. That's an easy way to get constitutive expression. The repressor can never repress because the protein itself, lac repressor, doesn't recognize the operator sequence anymore. So that's a second type of mutation. By contrast, we can also talk about a third type of mutation, which is also to lac I, but it's called the super repressor, lac I S. With the LAC IS mutation, this is still a mutation to LAC I, the protein. It's a different mutation than I minus, though. So now, if you wanted to design this mutation, you'd have to think about if we're going to be a super repressor, that means even in the presence of lactose, we still want this LAC I protein product, LAC repressor, to be bound to this 
operator. So we're still going to have lacropressor have a DNA binding domain. It's going to need that if it's going to repress at all, as we learned in the previous example, the lac I minus mutation. So what change can we make to lac I, lac repressor, that will prevent it from able from ever being dissociated or falling off of the operator? Well, these lac super repressor mutations change the shape of the allosteric site so that, for example, a triangle shaped molecule no longer binds this round binding pocket. So in this case, lac repressor binds the operator and it always sits there and can never be removed from the operator because there's no small molecule effector, or at least lactose is not a small molecule effector that can bind to that allosteric site and cause lac repressor to fall off of the operator. So in this case, in the presence or the absence of lactose, the repressor is always bound to the operator and you never get transcription in any circumstance of the lac Z, lac Y, and lac A proteins.